There are a couple little tricks though that might hang you up. They did, at least for me when I first did this. Um, this notice is important, right? So um, do you read that? Cause it could be a little bit confusing. I'm gonna close that as this loads up. We've got a chat coming out. I'll just take a quick look. Okay, Megan's sending a link. Oh, Thanks, Megan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So the default when you open up the screen is to show you data, not for downloading data. So that's important to know. When you when you first open this up, you may be trying to draw a rectangle and make something happen. It's not, you're not going to get data without pushing a couple extra buttons. So to do that, you can hover over the tools here, and I'll go to download tool, and you need to drill in a little bit and make sure that you're not getting data you don't want. All right, so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up the vegetation and see that the existing vegetation type data set is just pre-selected. So just know that, you may or may not like that. I'm gonna leave it selected. I'm also gonna pick a couple others so you see how this looks. And then I'm gonna go, I'm gonna draw a rectangle. So you could um, put in a, a template selection like a state or a county, you get a drop down list, or you can put in coordinates. But I typically draw a rectangle. I'm going to draw a small one. And this is what happens. You get this, uh, you get this page, and it'll have your data sets listed. And then you can hit download, which I won't do at the moment. But what happens is you get um, files such as this one that I did this morning. All right. So it's going to have some long, funky, um, designation on the front of it, then it'll have the geography, US, AK, HI, or, a, or IA for the insular areas, and then the name of the data set. And it's pretty slick, you know, it's already, it's once you unzip it, you're good to go. I'll add that in just, just for fun. Um, you drill down to the, you know, I think um, typically it would have the TIFF designation. But there we go. I downloaded data for this area yesterday um, just for fun. I'll symbolize it really quick just to make sure that it looks good by EBT name. All right, uh, cent South Central Minnesota, a lot of agricultural agricultural areas in our existing vegetation type data as expected. So Randy, Randy, how old is this data that I'm looking at right here? Yes, great question. So um, if you go back, that's a great question. Thanks for that, Megan. Um, if we go back to the get data um, and we go, so you can check it out in a couple places. If we go here, you get sort of the, the, the versions. And if you dig into this version descriptions, you get sort of the, the disturbance imagery or, or what's being represented there. And then you get the completion date. All right, so um, when you download the data, it would just say 200 without the, the periods or the decimals. Um, so basically, the data that we were looking at, Megan, long answer your question, are represented conditions in central Minnesota around 2016. Yes, so that's. You know, it's definitely worth watching these versions and they're going to be changing more quickly. We're, we'll have another session on um, going through all the versions and the, the new naming convention that will be coming online and how the new refresh data will be created. Um, it'll be important to keep you all updated on that. So watch for the postcards, watch for open, open office hours on that. Um, I don't really feel equipped to go into that at the moment, though others on the call might. Um, but great question, Megan. So with that, I think I'm done with my little demo. We thought we would start these open office hours with a bit of a demo just to kick things off. And um, I think what I'll do is stop sharing my screen and we'll go into kind of question, discussion, answer mode, if, if that's okay with people. That sounds good to me. So don't be shy. Turn your camera on and feel free to whoever wants to chime in first, go for it. And we do have a couple questions queued up. So if there's awkward silence, we'll, silence, we'll try and uh, avoid that as much as possible, but no good. Or we'll call on you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So Chuck. Hey, Randy, Megan, I'll jump in with something here. Is uh, thanks for the demo. That was really great uh, and and concise. Uh, you know, Randy, like you, I, I used to always use the LFDAT, the data access tool, and then sort of uh, shifted away from that towards the, the data distribution service. Um, and I, I guess I just, I don't really know, maybe you guys can answer this question. It sort of seemed like the data access tool was not really being maintained um, uh, that regularly. And when something would change or, you know, there would be like a database table that needed to be updated that hadn't been updated and it would, you know, I just got frustrated with it. And I went back to the DDS and I was like, which used to be really hard to use in the early days. And I got to that and I was like, oh, this is great. Um, and I was going to say one other, one other thing you might show is <laughs> when you click on that modify button, um, you get more options. And one of those options that I find extremely useful is the ability to download the data in the best fit UTM projection. So it does that for you on the server side and saves you some time when you, when you get the data to your, your desktop. Um, although I was very happy to see in the latest postcard that the, uh, the, you know, the US wide uh, mosaics are in TIFF format. Um, you know, even though you showed that that was three megab or gigabytes, I think, unzipped, that's still magnitude smaller than it would be in an art grid. So it's, it's really <laughs> awesome. I'm going to start downloading all the layers for myself and have them on my hard drive now. So thanks for doing that. that that's my two cents. Great. Well, thanks, Don. Great kind of uh, addendum to my comments. Thank you. And I agree with everything you said about the Lampfire Data Access Tool and the DDS now. And I'm going to go, we're going to go tread some new water for me. Like I said, I usually have the mosaics. But what I'm going to do is, um, if you remember, um, I drew a square. And when I drew this, or I'll just do it again. This is fun. I drew, drew a rectangle with my three data sets selected and I get this page and I mentioned the download button and, but I did not go over the modify button. So good call out there. And this is a new territory for me. Um, so here goes, jump in. If you see something I should click or do, hopefully it's, are you seeing my screen? Yeah, we see your screen. Okay, great. Okay. So, it looks to me, all right, wow, incredible. Thank you. All right, so we have um, NAD 1983 Albers, or we have the Best Fit UTM. Um, check that. And I'm guessing when I select that, the data format is going to change. Uh, if it waits, takes too long, I'll, I'll wait for uh, maybe, oh, yeah, nice. Okay, great. Okay, so you can still get the art grid here, it looks like, though. Um, wow, right, as Dawn said, I always go with the GeoTIFF. Um, and then there are some other format questions. Uh, do you want it, the, the TGZ or the zip file and um, your metadata format? So, yeah, thanks so much for pointing that out. That's huge, especially the output projection and datum. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think what happens if you scroll down, I think the the three original ones you had checked will still be checked. Yeah. I don't remember um, exactly. And then yeah, when you yeah, say, yeah, yeah they yeah. are okay. Yeah. And then when you hit the save your changes and return up on the top or at the bottom, yeah. Um, All right. Yep. When you click that and, button, and it's going to take you back to that previous screen with the download buttons, but, but you'll see that it changed the projection that's listed. Um, nice. Yeah. Okay. And, and Don, this is Jim. I'm not sure I'm correct on this, but I think pre-2016, you can still get in grid or TIFF. I think the TIFF only is now just 2016. So if somebody really wants a grid file, then you can get it um, pre and, and the grid will always be available on the data download site as a choice. The mosaics are the ones where they've restricted to the TIFF because of the size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll comment too, Don, uh, the LFDAT, uh, anytime you have a tool in Esri, 
you know, they're constantly shifting the ground under your feet. It's hard to keep up with it. And then we change our data structure. So I think it is fair to say that we haven't kept up with the maintenance of LFDAT, but it is still considered a tool that we are going to try to, to keep working. Um, but you're, you're right that we have not done the greatest job trying to keep that tool up to date the very moment Esri changes, you know, the, the background platform. Yeah, and I pulled up the website just for context in case it wasn't familiar to you. Um, yeah, and as Don said, this is the way I, I used to always bring in data, uh, land fire data. You would draw, it would be an arc map and you would draw a square rectangle and basically connect you to the data distribution site. But I, I, because of the issues that Jim and Don have brought up, um, I don't, I don't use this anymore. So, yeah, but thanks, Don, for those questions. And uh, I think there was a, a, a question in the, in the chat about the um, modify button. So thanks for that. Yeah. Chuck, yes, thank you. Yeah, this is Chuck, Randy. Um, and also, if you could go back to that, if you still had that modify option open, I guess what I want to point out there is the using the best fit UTM when you download the fuels and fire data themes is important for use with the geospatial models like FlanMap for predicting fire behavior because the defaulted land fire map datum and projection will skew will skew it rotates your landscapes in a direction that isn't favorable for use in like models like FlanMap. It requires them to be in a north top orientation and that Nat Albers out of here is as close as you can get. And then the other thing I want to point out for folks is if you scroll down there, you can get the landscape file already created in here. There's a, so yeah. if you go to um, 2000, I if you scroll up just a little bit further, I think, well, right below where your button is, you got a, a landscape with the 40 or the, or the 13 fuel models, and then you can use it directly right into Flam, an application like FlamApp. So you don't have to download all eight individual data themes and then build your landscape. You can use this to actually build your landscape for you and then just bring it right in. You know, I bet that it's it's interesting because one of the most downloaded data sets that I know about is the elevation data set, um, especially the, the big mosaic, because we just, it's all there, you know, and I bet that's sort of the same for this data set. Um, it just saves a lot of work for somebody that needs that LCP file that we've compiled all that right there. So thanks for pointing that out, Chuck. That's, yeah, that's that's a, a, a time saver for people for sure. Yeah, I just find that that's not, in the, not well known by folks, especially the modifying the projection. When I have, when I help people with FlanMap and they have issues, they don't know that that option exists or they don't know that. So it's important to point out on this call or when you have other opportunities. Thanks. Yeah, Chuck, we'll, we'll look, make a note of that. We'll, yeah, and I understand the flam map. What about Farsight and some of the other similars? Is it the same? Well, all of them, if you're going to use it, okay. Farsight now has been rolled up into flam map. So okay. flam map, Farsight doesn't exist as a standalone, but even okay. applications like FSIM, if people are going right. to use that, and, and Don's aware of FSIM, but if you're going to use any of the geospatial modeling tools or their command line versions, yeah. it's important that your landscape is in a north up orient, top okay. north orientation. So Megan, let's make a note for the postcard. We can we can make a good okay. statement about that in the next postcard. Thanks, thanks a lot, Chuck and Don. Yeah, for and, that. yeah, that would be. And you guys had some uh, tutorials and stuff and announcements and some real early on types of um, notifications on data notifications and stuff. Because like early on, like around 2009 or 10, somewhere in there, there were some 
uh, those types of tips or announcements. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Chuck. I think that'd be great, though, to, yeah, to have, uh, have that kind of highlighted again, because it is such an important issue. Um, ironically, the only place where you probably wouldn't need to do that projection is where Randy drew his box, because it's pretty close to the central meridian of that projection. Of course. But, uh, <laughs> what, 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 the, what the issue is... Strategic. <laughs> yeah. What the issue is for folks that like to geek out on coordinate systems and projections is that, you know, as the Albers equal area, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's goal in life is to maintain area across its whole extent. Right. So an acre on the East coast is the same as an acre in the Midwest is the same as an acre in the, um, on the West coast. But in order to do that, it has to skew some other properties and um, the properties that get skewed, obviously, are, are direction. Um, you, look at a, you look at a map in Albert's equal area of the whole country, and your east coast and your west coast are not pointing north anymore, right? So uh, that becomes a real problem with fire behavior modeling because we rely on wind direction. Um, so it really would be any model that might rely on wind direction. So if, you know, if say you had some sort of seed dispersal or uh, smoke dispersal or something like that, I think it would also be an important point. Yeah, and it doesn't take long. Like in Montana, it's an 18 degree shift or rotation in the landscape wow. angle. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you get clear out on the East Coast or West Coast, it's up to, it's like 21 degrees of rotation. So it's pretty, it's pretty critical right so that's what's great about the data stream i'll put in a plug for your data stream and using that land fire rest service to grab your data is that it creates a custom projection based on the extent of your box that puts it into a true top north orientation so it removes it completely it makes it completely compatible with anything that would be relying on a wind wind direction input, so and especially geospatial fire modeling. Wow. You know, I'm not in the fire world myself, um, but the overall concepts that you're talking about, about understanding the data, and especially when you start putting different data sets together, um, that applies, you know, period. So it's a great reminder. Um, I'm more on the vegetation side. Uh, so it, what I see people do is mix up some of the data sets in that way. It's not so much a projection issue, but just understanding the data. And it, it takes a lot of time and experience or someone just to blat blatantly say it like you guys did for people to, to get it because it's just, it's a lot to know. So thanks for that. Thanks for, thanks for chiming in and being our, asking our first question, guys. <laughs> and I've, I've taken a note for future postcards um correspondent so we'll be sure to um tackle this in the future and maybe yeah. just to build on what chuck's saying relative to the streaming data there's going to be more coming there soon um, we're looking to expand um, that so you know landfire over the course of history we started with dvds we've got the you know lf dat the data service that randy you know just demonstrated um, and we're going streaming more and more. So there will be more of that on the horizon um, with more details to come. Great. Thanks, Henry. So before I start going through the registration questions, any other thoughts, ideas, questions, challenges? Um, you know, we don't, we could, we could spend 30 minutes helping you solve your art map problem if the group was into that. Um, but I, you know, I'm game for you to share your screen and show a problem you've got, um, something cool you're doing and we can spend some time on it, then, you know, move on to another topic or set up a one-on-one or something. We're, we're just totally open for, um, to be here. And if, yeah, if you don't know, have questions, I can run through some from the registration.
Maybe. Uh, oh, Sean hey, Mc Sean. Hey, hey there. How's it going? Good. How are you? Not too bad. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Just a couple of comments. Um, the, uh, regarding the LDAT and Esri versioning, um, not only do we have the regular updates with uh, Esri versioning, but how uh, federal agencies acquire Esri um, in different versions can also vary. So it's like this double moving target um, between the two and trying to match it up. So anytime that I needed to use um, LDAT in the past, it was on a version, I think it was 10.2 or 10.3. Um, now our agency has updated it to uh, 10.7 and there's a, a match up there. So that we now on the Citrix environment have uh, um, LDAT 10.7. Uh, um, the other thing is that, uh, of course, I work in a lot of modeling and a lot of data analysis. So uh, in our region, NAT83 UTM11 is this, the gold standard um, as far as how we, you know, that, and, and that's also true for our agency standard for GIS is um, it's also a NAT83. So I, I'm constantly looking at the and converting. I, I very rarely use the Albers data set, although I, I appreciate it there. And then having the TIFF, but most of the time I'm looking at a analysis, some display uh, purposes, but mostly analysis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sean. And Sean, can you tell us who you are and when what you what you do a little bit? Um, just yeah, to, I'm yeah. I'm a, a fuels program manager and fire planner here in Southern Nevada, uh, working for the Bureau of Land Management. Um, background: I started in fire in Region One. And then uh, went to Yellowstone National Park for a number of years and then uh, joined the BLM uh, a, a, a number of years ago now and uh, worked my way south. And so I'm, I'm in the Mojave Desert Eco Region and uh, working on some of our uh, fire problems down here. Awesome. Great. Thanks for joining us. Great. Any Randy, other comments? Yes. Mohammed, go for it. We were yeah. Hi, about, but. Yes. Hi, hi, Megan and Randy, and thank you so much uh, for your time and for doing this. Yeah, and my question is on the queue, so I said I might as well just ask that question. Uh, so um, I apologize. The question is not a direct follow-up to uh, the, to the uh, land fire products per se. No problem. Uh, so right now working on uh, uh, basically uh, uh, fuel mapping, creating a, an application for fuel mapping using uh, uh, remote sensing type data and some machine learning. And uh, I'm trying to use uh, the Landfire reference database and basically the survey data, the underlying data. And uh, I, I'm having a little bit of a hard time parsing uh, the Landfire reference database. And I wanted to just ask a couple questions that might help me be able to parse the data. So what I want to know is I see in the, in the data, uh, there is a uh, event ID and there's a point ID. And I'm trying to see if this one of these or either of these uh, correspond to uh, basically plot the uh, same like FIA equivalent of, I kind of know that uh, I'm guessing these are not FIA data, right? Because because the locations, uh, so these are like public data from other sources that uh, you all have. But I'm trying to see what is the scale or the unit? Uh, is that like, are these each row of the data or each event or point equivalent of a, a plot? Um, that's my first question. Great. I think if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll point to my supervisor, Jim Smith, who is probably more familiar with that database. If, if you don't mind, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, yeah, the, the, there should be a record in a table for every mm -hmm. plot that is publicly available. Okay. So there is a point idea that we establish for publicly available plots. And you're right, it doesn't include FIA and some other data sets that are not publicly available. We allow people to um, state that they don't want their data to be distributed. But that doesn't make up the majority of the plots, at least that's my understanding. So there are a lot of plots there and each row in the table should be an individual plot. There are a lot of course, in this logical database design, there are a lot of other associated tables right, where you go through and get the tree yeah. data and things like that sure. in the uh, tables. The event ID, events in the land fire parlance 
are about, you know, things that happen. You did a treatment, you did a, uh, a harvest, or there was a fire, or there was a windstorm, or something like that. People submit events, and they get their own ID as well. So event ID pertains to one action or, or something that happened on a landscape that we either found ourselves or were um, submitted to us. Sometimes, by the way, there are points. TNC submits fire points, but that would still have an event ID. Most events would have a polygon, some sort of boundary with information associated with them. So most of the time events are not points, but they can be if that's all somebody submits. Okay. okay that does makes that sense. answer? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. I um, mean, just mm -hmm. a quick follow up. Um, and I asked this through uh, the question, I guess, there's a questioning option. Um, so I submitted a question a while ago, just to uh, double check on that the locations of these are not in it's not like uh, uh, the FIA, these are not intentionally like uh, no. anonymized, or these are like accurate no. as far as okay. If they're publicly available, they're exactly the coordinate that were given to us when they were submitted to us or we found them. Um, so we do not anonymize them at all. Okay. And in fact, we do try to do some sort of quality control check to make sure that they, the plots make sense where they're located because otherwise that would, since that's sure. how mapping is derived, we wouldn't want to use a plot that was anonymized in a mapping process. So we do try to uh, do a QC to eliminate plots with what look like bad locations. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And just to, uh, just for others, for, for a little context on, on that discussion, um, if you go to landfire.gov and go to reference, you'll find the, the products and descriptions that they were just discussing. Um, we deliver some databases that have a fair amount of information that we use to help in the mapping process. Um, but yeah, I wanted to just quick pull that up so you could see what was what was being discussed there. And you can download these. And uh, yeah, Jim has a lot more experience with it than, than I do. And probably Mohammed, you've probably uh, been going back and forth in the database now as well. Randy, what if I wanted to submit an event? You know, what if I wanted to? Uh, great question. Team? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Gosh, great question. Um, so that would be, um, well, I would just overarching say thank you for that question. Land fire data quality is like, you know, pretty directly tied to the, the number and quality of plots we have in a place. Um, so there's uh, land fire gov, there's a contribute data button and there's all the all the kind of information you need would be there um, also we try to be as open as we can be with this so if for some reason this doesn't work and you want to contact any you know the land fire help desk or someone on the you know land fire team you can do that and we can answer more questions about um, plot submission I also say that uh, we do put out, put out a data call, um, so if you watch the postcards and other communications from Landfire, you'll see you'll see that information. But yeah, basically, if it's geo-referenced, um, it might be of use for us. And has veg vegetation yeah, well, and fuels information. Yeah. And Mohammed, importantly, there you'll also see there are tables there that show who we've gotten data from yeah. to give you an idea about what may be included and what's not included. And I think that's kind of important for people to know. If you see something that might be available that we don't know about, we'd love to receive it because plots are really critical to the mapping process. Good quality plots are the most important thing about uh, input to mapping. So definitely look that over. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. I just, uh, this reminded me of a uh, quick follow-up. Um, so, um, so the, the number, if I want to know the number of plots that are available to me in that data set, uh, what I would do, I mean, I'm, my application, I guess I said, is fuel mapping. So I'm basically looking more for the fuel data, available fuel data that mm -hmm. I could use. 
is that I, for example, downloaded the California uh, or the, the Pacific uh, Southwest data that includes California, which is where I am focusing right now. And I kind of see about a thousand, if, uh, let me make sure, a, a thousand rows in the table that has fuels, but a okay. whole lot more like 16,000 events else, elsewhere uh, that, I mean, some of which is connected to all this and some of which is not. So if I am I'm just uh, make, making sure that I'm interpreting all this correctly is that uh, those uh, thousand points for which there's fuel data is all I have, like in terms of plots that have fuel data associated. The events, which are a whole lot more, 16,000, those are just like you said, right. like disturbances, things that happen, uh, yeah. not, not necessarily related to fuels. That's how I would interpret it, Mohammed. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest that you send us a note in the okay. help desk okay. and let us refer to the people who actually manage that data. Okay. Sure. Check for us to say, yeah, that that's all we have. Fuels sure. data is a lot less common than the regular veg data. Mm -hmm. You know, cover fuels data comes in a lot, a lot less often. So, sure. surprised that the number is limited. But just mm -hmm. to verify it, I would submit a question to the help desk, mm -hmm. and they will send it to the person who can check for us to make sure. Okay. I, and I saw a note on the website that says. The more recent data that corresponds, I guess, to the remap effort would be released later whenever that uh, effort is yes. finished. And the data that I see, at least for the Pacific Southwest, goes from eight, uh, 1985, I guess, to 2006. I guess this is just specific to California, probably other places. There might be more recent data, a little bit more recent. But this ends at 2006. Uh, my question is... Um, do you have like do you you guys know when more recent data might be available because because 2006 right. there's like all the data I will have problems with like finding remote sensing data that corresponds to that obviously right, right? so so all the data that's been collected since the original version of Landfire mm -hmm. has been put in the publicly available data sets that are downloadable yet and the the the, the reference team is working on that and will do that once the remap production for uh, 16 is done. So they didn't want to do that two or three times, Muhammad. They're waiting sure. until sure. they got the entire process done. But it would include plots even after 2016. Okay. Submitted to us that's publicly available will be there. So um, I don't have an exact date on that, but let me check. I will find out if we have an exact date on that delivery. I don't know there is. But I'll check and, and let you know if, if I can find out an exact date, okay? Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Mohammed. And like I said, this it's possible that, you know, you all might have helpful information, you know, to share. So we open, we're totally open to um, not being the experts here, I guess. <laughs> So if you feel like unmuting yourself and turning your camera on, like, uh, please chime in. Hey, Mohammed, uh, may I ask what you're, uh, what you're using the fuels data, the plot, sure. the fuels plot data for? And I, I assume you're like, I assume that data is like surface fuels data, like Brown's transect information and stuff. Sure. Uh, yeah, I apologize. I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I am with the uh, UCLA. Um, we are part of a team that um, just recently got funded for a fire uh, management and I mean more simulation modeling ma uh, management uh, type project. Let me post uh, a link to our website uh, in the chat for everyone's uh, information. And uh, my uh, part of the project is more focused on fuel mapping uh, by basically trying to use uh, the more recent uh, machine learning, deep learning um, techniques to connect remote sensing data, uh, be it uh, satellite data um, or LIDAR, radar, uh, all kinds of data 
uh, to uh, basically fuel surface fuels as well as uh, canopy fuels for the purpose of simulation. The rest of the project will then take that input, which is supposed to be just more up, uh, up to date. I mean, I hope, I'm hope, uh, hopeful that we will be able to just update whenever we want uh, the fuels and other information from that, extract all that, give it to the, uh, to the fire uh, simulation engine. And they're supposed to be doing this thing that's called uh, model updating, which is basically they see the result of the fire spread, they compare it to historical fires, then they update the inputs and uh, that way they will try to be like build more accurate models out of that and also quantify uncertainties in the process, in the fuels and in the inputs of the model and all that. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my application. Thanks for sharing your website. Uh, th yeah, thank you. Thanks. This is Patrick uh, Doyle. I have a question, uh, or actually I shouldn't say a question. Uh, I actually came on uh, not with any specific questions. I knew there that this would have some uh, good discussion and that there'd be some good questions asked. Um, uh, Patrick Doyle, I'm a Forest Service. Uh, I work for the Regional Office as a Fields Planner. Um, tied in with some of the work with uh, land fire. And one of the questions I had was regarding um, in the 26 uh, land fire 2.0 was uh, last year through the all lands uh, hazard assessment, we did a, an, an update or a calibration for the, um, what was for a project for the state uh, in the forest service. Um, one of the things that's come out, and I'm sorry I haven't cannot enable my uh, video. Um, I went to try to enable, and something's going on. I'm not sure, but no worries. Um, but uh, one of the things is because of the events that occurred last year, the fires, we're looking at we're looking at uh, updating that landscape, the uh, uh, fuels calibration for it, and uh, through working with Pyrologics we found out that they're also working uh, on a separate project with California Energy Commission uh, for the infrastructure modeling. And they're already going ahead in updating that uh, fuelscape um, for those events to that 2016 land fire uh, updated calibrations. And I was just, I guess my question would be is, are, you know, I would, think that you guys are aware of this and I was wondering if that's something that's going to be coming out or being uh, implemented uh, or reviewed uh, by land fire. I think uh, Jim oh, or uh, Henry Bastion would be the best yeah. Yeah, okay. answer to that. I'll, I'll let Henry go first. One. Henry first. And then I'll just Thank say, you. you know, Pat, Patrick, he, he's being modest and uh, which is good because um, he has a member of the land fire advisory group um, representing the kind of the Pacific um, West country. So if you've got issues, concerns, maybe not to put Patrick on the spot, but just know that he's a good resource and, you know, we really appreciate his participation. Um, so to Patrick's um, point, um, there have been, well, maybe I'll step back just a little bit. Land Fire did a national calibration, kind of back to what Chuck was talking about in the early days. And we went around and did a bunch of calibration efforts. Since then, we have not, um, you know, done that. And of course, we were kind of waiting to see what would happen with the Land Fire 2016 remap. And we've been relying mainly on state and or regional um, calibration assessments, because there's been a number of them that have been completed. Um, case in point, let's take the Northeast. Um, same company, Pyrologic with Joe Scott, um, was contracted to do the work with that Northeast um, risk assessment. We did a review of their calibration um, effort, and timing was perfect because they did their um, calibration in advance of what we were doing with the Land Fire 2016 remap, and we were able to um, accommodate and make changes of roughly the 30, I'll say the 35 that they submitted, we, you know, took 30 to 32 of those and said, yep, great, 
recommendations, good suggestions. So to Patrick's um, point, um, Patrick has shared some initial information that has occurred there um, within Region 5 and the Forest Service. Um, we've at least started to take a look at that. We need, I think, to do a little bit more follow-up with Patrick um, and others, because there are other areas that are doing the same thing. Um, let's take the state of Colorado, for instance. They've done a recent calibration as well. Um, so those efforts um, we are evaluating right now, and, and we need to do a little bit more discussion with folks to then you know, determine what can we do. Um, the timing, of course, is the big issue with this, is when might we be able to do some updates based upon these calibrated da data. And I would say that's not likely to occur until probably 2022. So, you know, next year is when we might be able to, you know, realize or reap the benefit of seeing some of those calibration, um, you know, work. So I don't know if that fully answers your question or not, Patrick, but uh, you know, we're super excited about, you know, people sharing that information. And if same, no different than what um, Jim Smith mentioned about, if you know of point data, polygon data, that we may not have, please let us know. Same thing goes with these you know, calibration efforts. Um, we're very interested in seeing what folks are doing and how we may be able to improve the quality of the data because of you know, good folks like yourself doing um, that kind of type of work. So I think maybe we stop there, Patrick, and you can then say, yeah, you hit it, or wow, you're, you're way off the mark. No, that, that, was, uh, that was actually what I was looking for. Uh, thank you, yes, that, that's, that's the spot. And just to make sure that it's clear, Patrick, you know, your 2020 fires will not be in the next land fire product that will be delivered this spring. It was just the production schedule. It just couldn't be done. But we're hoping that next year, a year from now, we will be incorporating an annual update that will have the 2020 and 2021 disturbances in them to be delivered in the spring of 2022. That's, that's the effort that's under, underway right now. The next product you see will not have your terrible 2020 fire season included in the land fire data. Okay. No, that, that's good to and know. Maybe, maybe, Megan, we put that on the list just to talk about what's land fire doing. Okay. Great data. I appreciate Sean's comments. That's, that's super helpful. But... You know, it's old, to Patrick's point. I've got some disturbances. I need to update this stuff. Um, where is land fire going? What's your time frames? What will be included when? And, you know, to help set some of those expectations, we could go into more details on that. That's good feedback. I'll take that now. Right. Um, folks, as we're getting to the top of the hour, I was uh, – just hoping, if you would, you throw something in the chat about how you use land fire, um, or if another question came to mind that we might not address at the moment, but address, you know, in another office hours, uh, throw that in the chat. Uh, we will save the chat and, and have that. Also, I hope this serves sort of as an introduction to us for you. If you want to reach out to us, you know, if you'd rather do email or a one-on-one -on -one Zoom or something, please uh, reach out between between folks in the community and as we get to know more and more about what people are doing, we can connect people and get answers. Um, there's just so much to know. I've been doing this for a while and I couldn't, I couldn't tell you exactly how fuel calibration works. I mean, there's so much to know, but we can, we can figure that out for you. So please, please reach out. Um, yeah. And I'll just say yeah. um, things, I'm going to put up a quick anonymous poll so that we can sort of gauge how we're doing. Um, but I want to also say, like, things are going to get, will get sort of more honed and better as we do these open office hours. So um, definitely appreciate everybody coming in today and, and taking um, the evaluation poll. I'm not seeing any other questions pop up. Does anybody have any last minute things they want to ask? Don't be shy. I know those government computers have a hard time, like, Turn on cameras and stuff, you know. So my, my husband's a government employee, and it's a real pain. Well, I, I do have one. Is yeah. uh, uh, is we're going into updates for the Northwest Forest Plan and uh, Forest Plan revision for some of the forests there. 
one of the efforts that's going on is we're also looking at updating the existing veg in that landscape. And it, it's a process that probably will be finished till uh, end of this year for those, those forest plans. But I was just wondering with that type of uh, work being done on that, is there a way to be able to convey or share that information with land fire? And uh, I guess that's, that's really it. Yeah, Patrick, I'll start an answer on that one, um, and then others can chime in. So I, that well, that would be great. And so I'm not I'm not in the bowels of Eros making the data, so I, I can't speak super specifically. But my experience, if there are sort of universal things you see, like a oh, land fire typically map over maps, you know, mesic species, that's good to know. But then further, if you can tell us, you know. We recommend that you, instead of mapping music at this elevation, slope, and aspect, and soils, map this. If you can give us specificity, that's useful. That said, what what we've done before is we in Arc Map, we would just do a simple combine of Landfire EVT data and your data, spit out the attribute table, then go into a you know a pivot table is great for this, and just see how they compare and see what we can learn. Um, but yeah, we need that specificity for the mappers to to know what to change. If we're going to change anything, that's that's more Henry's side about what can be changed when. But um, I would say, yeah, we'd love to see that. And again, we can always explore and learn and probably make our data better with what you guys learn. Um, I'll also add, I've worked with the Wayne National Forest on their forest plan revision. I did their terrestrial ecosystem assessment. And how we did it there was we used land fire cover and height data, and we used their ecological land type data. And we combined those three data sets together to basically develop a, a custom grid of vegetation type height and cover for the, the Wayne National Forest in Ohio. So I just throw that out there. It's not, I know I feel like folks on the West are pretty sophisticated, the force out there in terms of their GIS and modeling capacity, but there's a lot of creative things you can do to get a better product in the end. Yeah, th th this is just an effort. We're just uh, kind of pushing forth for the forest plan revisions and assessments, but the remote sensing lab is taking that on of, of doing those updates. And just because some of those forests had pretty significant events over the last, uh, you know, three years, like, yes. you know, uh, Mendocino, 90, approximately 98% of the forest had fire over it in the last three years. Wow. 